today's topic would be atrophic rhinitis which apart from rhinosporidiosis and rhinoscleroma are the most important topics for the diseases affecting only the nose apart from this you will also have the regular chronic granulomatous diseases and the i mean especially of the infectious variety and non infectious variety which will also be asked but please try to take into consideration this is a non allergic non vasomotor type of rhinitis and the whole um, disease is limited to the nasal cavity as such it doesn't go beyond the nasal cavity it affects the sinuses also but primarily the disease is in the nose nasal cavity only with respect to my teachers let us begin the topic for the discussion well this is one of the topics wherein we have a proper definition not definition as in we cannot change a single word here we say chronic it is a chronic nasal disease characterized by progressive atrophy of mucosa and the underlying bone with formation of crust and characteristic foul smell called ozena emanating from the nose each and every comma full stop word is important this is going to be asked specifically in the practical examinations this is also by the most common thing a four marks question and a two marks question also so how do we identify this disease and what are the types etiologically we have divided we can divide the atrophic rhinitis into one primary or secondary that is it is primary because of some unknown cause and secondary because of special um, in specific diseases infections or surgery in the nose which will lead to atrophic rhinitis apart from that histopathologically it is divided into type 1 and type 2 depending on whether the estrogen receptors are present or not because the presence or absence of estrogen receptors will help us in the treatment modality that is if the estrogen varieties are there uh, the um, endarteritis and periarteritis are possible are noted wherein you give estrogen there will be benefit but supposing type 2 wherein we, there is no inflammation of the vessels and on the other hand that is the other extreme there is vasodilation it will cause worsening of the symptoms that's why again histopathologically we can divide it into type 1 and type 2 let us see what do we exactly mean by primary atrophic rhinitis primary atrophic rhinitis is a disease quite common in india china and egypt and it is more common in females because and primarily it starts at the uh menarche that is the moment we have our secondary sexual characters beginning and the hormones are kicking in and the estrogen progesterone level increase that is when the disease is most commonly seen we really don't have an idea whether it is a hereditary in nature but very commonly it has been seen that it is present in more than one family member apart from that it is seen in low socioeconomic status uh, people so maybe because of malnutrition maybe because of hypoproteinemia or because of deficiency in vitamins especially vats fat soluble vitamins more so vitamin a there is also a chance of infection which is because of klebsiella species cocobacillus 
diphtheriaids. There are many other causative organisms, but they may be the secondary bacterial infection rather than the primary infection as such. Apart from that, the autoimmune disease, wherein the body's defense mechanism take uh, the nose as a uh, what do we say? They react against the body itself. This is what is primary atrophic rhinitis. Secondary atrophic rhinitis is usually because of usually uh, unilateral as in the atrophic changes occur whenever there is a gross deviation. It was postulated that it are the, the atrophic changes because of uh, which occur because of the high air flow on the concave side that is the opposite side of the deviation but very rarely we get to see this apart from that there are specific infections like syphilis leprosy lupus rhinoscleroma which will cause atrophic changes in the nasal mucosa these are what are more likely to cause secondary atrophic rhinitis apart from that irradiation for especially in maxilla or if it all say for um, pituitary tumors or because of the alveolar margin previously we used to see too many cases of atrophic rhinitis but right now because of the improvement in the radiation technology we are having less i mean less frequency of atrophic rhinitis secondary to radiation apart from that radical surgery on the nose what do we mean by that that is if we tend to do over correction of the deviated nasal septum or we do a extensive rhinoplastic procedure or say bilateral turbinectomy that is bilateral inferior turbinectomy apart from that the diseases such as rhinosporidosis which require a surgical debridement or angiofibroma mesopharyngeal angiofibroma removal will be very extensive apart from that say we are doing surgery for mucormycosis wherein we have to remove each and every bone at times we may have to do enucleation of the eye also removal of whatever the bone they at times the whole skin of the face of the mag or on the maxilla has to be removed or excessive removal or, or complete denudation of the mucosa or nasal polypi so anything which involves a radical surgery will lead to atrophic rhinitis so what is our pathology seen here we see the pathology in the mucosa and the submucosa we see pathology in the bone and we see pathology in the paranasal sinuses what exactly does it mean we have complete atrophy of the mucosa that is whatever is supposed to be a pink lining of the turbinates that becomes pale and jhadu what do we mean by jhadu that is the pseudo certified ciliated columnar epithelium will give rise to either a stratified or a cuboidal type of epithelium so that's why the vascularity will be less, less thereby the mucosa will be pale in uh, the color apart from that there will be atrophy of the glands the mucous glands which are there and the secretory glands which are there the cilia they stop beating so what happens the whatever the secretions minimal secretions which are formed they have they stay there only and because the air is being circulated every every act of circulation we have dryness and because and the submucosal layers will have the blood vessels it will cause either the one end of the spectrum will be the inflammation of the arteries which is specifically periarteritis and endarteritis to the vasodilation of the, of the capillaries so 
both the things will occur which on biopsy will be able to identify and then with this will be one of the reasons whether to start off an estrogen therapy or not apart from that the nerves the sensory nerves includes the nerve sensation over the valve area and the olfactory nerve endings they get atrophied now because of all this the symptomatology will start now this is what is happening to the mucosa what about the bone now the bone because there is an atrophy of the overlying blood vessels please understand blood vessels will also be included into the haversian canals of the flat bones so the blood vessels will lead to decreased blood supply to the bone and this will lead to osteoclastic activity once this osteoclastic activity will start it will lead to resorption the resorption is more commonly seen in inferior turbinate less commonly seen in middle turbinate and very rarely in the superior turbinate bulla ethmodalis at times may be affected but still what will be giving rise to the most common symptom that is the ruminous is because of the inferior turbinate hypertrophy i mean atrophy how much that it will be as good as as if it has been operated upon or removed upon the only symptom will be only thing with that will be remaining is a simple ridge like thing on the lateral wall with pale mucosa covering it so what are the things we can expect i told you we are going to have pale mucosa and then there is going to be resorption of the bones that is the nose is going to be more roomy then if the row nose is going to be more roomy why do should we have nasal block please try and understand for anything to feel whether the air is going in or out we need to have a sensation now this sensation is because of the fine nerve endings in the anterior end of the inferior turbinate and also the olfactory epithelium the moment inferior turbinate is atrophied what will happen is there will not be any nerve sensation this moment we don't have any nerve sensation we feel as if there is no breathing which is occurring apart from this what happens whenever there is a stasis of the water i mean the secretions whatever the little secretions are occurring that if it is not pushed behind by the ciliary epithelium what will it do because of the respiration which is occurring constantly there will be drying up of the crust of the secretions which will lead to crust crust in turn will lead to nasal block now this block once they have there because there will be super i mean secondary infection because of uh, other bacteria they will give rise to discharge the discharge will be black to green in color and may also be seen from the sinuses so there will be one he will complain of nasal block there will be a discharge which is because of the sinus infection or secondary bacterial infection and the, there will be this discharge is foul swelling but the person who is having it will not be having any smell why because the smell is lost because of the atrophy of the olfactory nerve endings or if the olfactory nerves are not yet exactly involved it can be because of the crusting which are blocking the air flow to the nerve endings so either way the foul smell is not perceived by the patient that's why it is called as a merciful anosmia now this is one of a two marks question whenever the crust dislodge what will happen there is going to be bleeding why bleeding because there is no vascularity to heal the 
underlying raw area so whenever we have crust and because of sneeze or because of forceful uh, attempts we may have dislodgement of the crust will, will lead to bleeding now this crust need not always be uh, sticking or limiting themselves to the nasal cavity this can extend posteriorly into the pharynx and larynx which will lead to again irritation of the throat which may manifest as dry persistent cough we will be trying to think of lung as a cause of uh, a source for the infection in cough but forget the nose that's why dry cough whenever we are having any problem please try to identify whether the nose is at cause or not apart from that there are many other symptoms which are very less frequent like there may be difficulty in swallowing why because there is dryness of the nose apart from this the person will be psychologically affected that is he may feel bad for himself that what is the disease i have got this is a very bad thing because one of the uh, major symptoms for anyone is quality of life if your quality of life is going down it's really difficult for a person to come up from the disease so whenever we are having this disease how will the present patient present on external examination he may have a depression because of atrophy of the nasal bones and the septum there may be complete loss of the septum which may give rise to a saddle nose deformity on anterior rhinoscopy we will see crusting which may be extending from the nasal valve area all the way back to the lateral wall posterior pharyngeal wall I mean posterior uh, part of the nasopharynx and the septum the mucosa if it all seen will be very pale and the first thing what you will be observing is so much of room that is what is called as empty nose syndrome you may have or may not have a septal perforation please remember saddle nose is not in the beginning stages it is always the lead presentation so this is what will be the signs now how do we differentiate it from other diseases what are the other diseases which we have to take into consideration these include the most common causes for secondary uh, atrophic rhinitis that is syphilis pox leprosy atrophic stage of rhinoscleroma and rhinitis sicca here syphilis will also be showing same atrophy of the mucosa but there will may be systemic signs like the chancre or the gamma tuberculosis will present with cervical lymphadenopathy loss of appetite cough anemia which will help us in identifying whether this is tuberculosis or not leprosy the lesions of the nerve skin lesions will be helping us to identify whether it is leprosy or not atrophic shade of uh, rhinoscleroma the mucosa here is not pale the mucosa is pink in rhinoscleroma and it is no turbinate resorption turbinate resorption or loss of turbinate bone is always a feature of atrophic rhinitis rhinitis sicca is here we have the crusting which is only in the anterior part of the nose and there is no foul smell so for atrophic rhinitis we need to have a proper foul smell wherein we should be also having crusting all along that is the whole of anterior and posterior part of the nasal cavity in atrophic rhinitis so what are the complications one because he doesn't have sensation normally if it all any mosquito or bug comes near our nose we have the nasal valve 
which will help us and trap the disease i mean by trap the insect by the sol gel layer which is there over the turbinates but now because the mucosa is not there what will happen the nerve sensation is also not there so here the flies will come in and because attracted by the foul smell and deposit their eggs the maggots have been noted which will eat away the dead bone and further complicate the whole system at times the disease more than the disease the nasal myiasis have been known to cause enter into the cranial cavity orbital cavity and cause destruction of the palate this again nasal myiasis itself is a two marks question for you people now complications include sinusitis please remember we have said it's a disease of the nasal cavity not the sinuses the sinuses are secondarily infected because the bacteria now have an unprecedented access to the sinuses so we may have sinus infection this in turn will be the because the sinus mucosa and the nasal mucosa is in continuous the eustachian tube orifice may also be affected inflamed or blocked by the crust which will lead to middle ear infections if we go further posteriorly the nasopharyngeal wall can be involved which may go inferiorly into the oropharynx and lead to pharyngitis and in very severe cases or very accelerated cases we may have atrophic laryngitis also these pharynx and larynx or the middle ear infections are fairly uncommon most common complication will be nasal myiasis and sinusitis now what do we do How do we manage this case in this the investigations include smear why do we need a smear because if at all there is we need to rule out the cause that is either leprosy or tuberculosis this biopsy can be from the skin or can be from the mucosa also vdrl test is done for syphilis and chest x-ray paranasal sinuses is done for ruling out tuberculosis and also to identify whether the paranasal sinuses are involved or not normally paranasal sinuses previously they used to do x-ray now we do more commonly ct scan of the paranasal sinuses apart from this in order to assess the general condition of the patient routine cbp random blood sugar and blood urea serum creatinine because and test which will determine the fitness of surgery will be also have to be done now what do we mean by what do we do for these patients these patients require improvement in the nutrition they are supposed to have high high protein diet and vitamin supplements especially vitamin a supplement now these are all very general measures we are supposed to improve the quality of life but how do we treat per se whatever the disease this includes nasal toilet nasal drops injections and oral medications why are they separate because first before doing anything our job is to make sure whatever we apply applies on the raw area because the mucosa is what has to be protected not the crust the crust are the by products which have to be removed first how do we remove that is what is done by the nasal toilet the nasal drops and all that are the topical applications after removing of the crust now let us see one by one what are the different things we do now in nasal toilet we have three different varieties that is alkaline nasal douching edinburgh school treatment k 
chemicity in antiosina solution what are we what do we mean by each one of this the alkaline nasal tension is done is actually a mixture of sodium bicarbonate 28.4 grams sodium diborate 28.4 grams and sodium chloride 56.7 grams we mix this mixture 1 teaspoon in 280 ml of water now this is used this solution is used by either a 26 syringe or a higgison syringe or a rubber catheter and it to nasal wash now this nasal wash is done twice a day why do we do all this because sodium bicarbonate will create a medium which will dissolve the crust sodium diborate will act as an antiseptic and sodium chloride will try to maintain the isotonicity so by doing this we are loosening the crust then we are maintaining the isotonicity of the whole uh, mucosal uh, lining and at the same time we are flushing it the physical act of doing it will cause the crust in crust to dislodge apart from this what is edinburgh school treatment in this hydrogen peroxide is used this in turn will cause crust dissolving and estrogen in arachidinous oil or coconut oil is then applied now this is what is called as a edinburgh school treatment there is also something what is called as a chemicitin antiosina solution what does it contain this is a solution in which every ml contains chloramphenicol 90 mg estradiol dipropionate 0.64 mg vitamin d 900 international units and propylene glycol which is used as a base now what do we do we apply this solution and flush it into the nasal cavity thereby everything will be as if we are dousing the crust now once we have done a toilet what are the things which we use now previously we used to use 25% glucose in glycerin either as a nasal drop or as a use a tampon which is soaked with this and put it inside three times a day this will help in uh increasing the and the proteolytic organisms are uh, prevented from growing and glycerin will help in moistening the crust and the whole thing will be helpful in becoming soft and regeneration of the mucosa is helped ethylene estradiol in arachis oil 1 is to 10000 ratio is applied liquid paraffin as nasal drops to soften the crust chloramphenicol or streptomycin nasal drops will also been used mandel's paint this is one solution which is iodine 1.25% potassium iodide in peppermint oil as 2.5% and 90% alcohol in glycerin please try and understand glycerin here is been used to moisten the crust and mucosa and so as to prevent the drying of the mucosa glycerin as such is also used by some people for anterior nasal packing so all these methods will help in loosening of the crust then apart from that what do we do we are using injections injection of the placental extracts 
injection of the streptomycin into the floor and the lateral wall of the uh, nose and autologous vaccines apart from that potassium iodide has been used because it will act as an irritant and increase the nasal solutions and very few people will also be prescribing rifampicin 600 milligrams once daily for 12 weeks they have these are all various regimes wherein people who have been you are using on regular basis will determine what is going to be their choice of action once we do care of the treatment then do we have any surgical options yes we do have surgical options the surgical options are all based on three basic principles that is one any surgery done to regenerate the epithelium if the epithelium can be regenerated yes that will be the best thing second because now the size of the nasal cavity has been very increased we need to decrease the size of the nasal cavity so there are surgeries which are used for decreasing the size of the nasal cavity and now the secretions are decreased so how do we increase the secretions so there are certain surgeries which are used now for three different actions principles we have three different surgical techniques they are Young's, modified Young's and Gardner's. What is Young's operation? This is in this in this surgery what we do is there are folds of the skin are raised from the anterior knees that is the vestibule area and closure closed sutured to each other. This will be closed for nine months to one year after which they are opened. Why, why do we wait for one year? Because the nasal mucosa is not working. So now, because high concentration of the oxygen in the expired air, remember, even though the nose is closed, the mouth is doing the respiration. So there will be some amount of air which will be going into the nasal cavity. So there will be high concentration of carbon dioxide, which will help the mucosa to regenerate and also the goblet cells but this will again lead to some problem that is halitosis that is because the patient will be breathing from mouth he will have smell from coming from the oral cavity and there will also be snoring the second surgery in this would be modified so that modified youngs in this same as youngs but there will be a three millimeter opening which is left just to maintain minimal respiration so why do we leave it because if it all we leave a 3 mm um, opening we can use an otoscope or an endoscope to look into the nasal cavity apart from that there is something what is called as a guard raise double breasting technique which is again the same principle but instead of one fold they are raised two folds now to decrease the size of the nasal cavity we can have that is lotton slaggers operation that is we medialize the lateral wall so that the lateral wall is made more medial it has got its own weaknesses let's not bother about it but just we are telling you what are the different things submucosal implants are most commonly thing as compared to medialization of the lateral wall now this it can be either into the septum or into the lateral wall the whole uh, whatever the grafting materials include or the implant material include the bone cartilage injection of uh, biomaterials such as teflon paraffin, acrylic, placental extracts, gold or ivory. The basic purpose is 
as far as possible to insert any implant which is going to give a minimal reaction to the tissue reaction. That's why submucosal implants are given either in the lateral wall or in the into the septum. Then there are the surgeries which will cause increase in the secretions. That is Witmax operation. That is we transport plant that parotid duct into the maxillary sinuses. But what will happen with this? Every time you have a fluid, there will be profuse rhinorrhea, which again has not been supported. Stellate ganglion block or the cervical sympathetic blockage, which will cause abolishing the sympathetic supply and there will be predomination of the parasympathetic, which will lead to increase in the blood supply whereby trying to regenerate the nasal mucosa. So, hoping that this will help. And there is also what is called as a Raghav Sharan's operation. That is, we have improved, we are transplanting the antral mucosa into the nasal cavity. All these operations, why are they important? Because not for you right now but because if we have an atrophic rhinitis patient it is really difficult for a routine clinician to avoid him because the smell is unbearable you feel compassionate for the empathy for the poor patient because you can never feel what psychologically he is undergoing and this is going to be a potential 10 marks question at times 4 marks question, definitely a 2 marks question. Apart from this, these are the, this is the most common thing apart from tonsil, septum or MCQs. Why? Because the variety of treatment options, variety of differential diagnosis because of its sheer crusting, there is a huge option for MCQ in the neat examination. So this is what is about the atrophic rhinitis. I will be speaking in next class about rhinoscleroma and rhinosporidiosis, two topics at a time. And then we'll go for the chronic infectious granulomatous diseases. Thank you.